Hey everybody, today is Monday, September 9th, 2019. My name is Matt Fury and this is The Rough Cut. Okay, Rough Cutters, it's not Halloween yet, but it is time to talk about editing things that go bump in the night. That awful Pennywise the Clown is back, and it's partly editor Jason Ballantyne's fault. Jason was behind the avid for the first installment of Stephen King's classic It, released in 2017. Uh, It Chapter One was a massive hit, grossing over $700 million worldwide. Despite Shirley being proud of their work, I doubt Jason and his colleagues could have imagined such success. Now, two years later, or 27 years later in the timeline of the story of It, the losers are all grown up and back in the town of Derry to do battle with Pennywise. Jason called in from London where he's off working on another film, presumably one you can watch with both eyes open. And he called in to talk to us about the challenges he faced and the choices he made in bringing this mighty tome to a scary yet satisfying conclusion. I mean, the audiobook version of it was 60 hours long, for crying out loud. So it's a miracle they got It Chapter 2 down to 2 hours and 50 minutes. But they did. And It has opened wide this past weekend. Get it? Open wide with the big mouth and all the teeth? I'm sorry. Anyway, here's our good friend, Jason Ballantyne. Speaking of marking time, um, nothing marks time also like like a movie. Um, and something that surprised me, and I don't know why it did, but it did, that Chapter 2, um, which premiered Friday, uh, premiered almost two years to the day from Chapter 1. And that's that's pretty remarkable how quickly that came out. And I was wondering, is that something, was the schedule always kind of compressed for that because you wanted to build off the, the heat of Chapter 1? You didn't want to let that sit for too long? Well, of course, that wasn't my decision, but um, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess... Uh, I guess they were, um, the studio were keen to, you know, not have too much time pass. And, and that's kind of the time it took too to get the script in order and pre-production and shooting post. We couldn't have done it much quicker than that. And uh, shooting in summer for both of them in Toronto as well, I guess, it, you know, had a part of um, the scheduling ideas and cast availabilities, I guess, too. Yeah, there, there was a coincidence that the release date of the first film added up to 27 years, or added up to 27, like 27 years. And then somebody said that this release date for the second film also added up to 27, but I don't know how good they were at math because when I added it up, it didn't seem to work. So, yeah, it's, it's I don't know. It's a good story. It's a good story, yeah, even if it's not true. The first film was a bit of a surprise to the tune of $700 million, making it the highest grossing open for a horror movie ever. And without question, the expectations are going to be very high for the second one. You know, the weekend's not over yet for the opening weekend, but there's estimates bouncing around about, I think, $100 million domestically. I could be confusing some numbers, but it's tracking to be the second biggest of all time, only coming in behind the first one. And the data point there is not the money, but the they're calling it a horror movie. And last time we spoke about the first one, you... We're pretty clear in that you felt that it was not a horror movie. It was a coming of age film with jump scares, as you called it. So now here we are 27 years later. It can't be a a coming of age film anymore. So how would you describe it? Chapter two. I mean, it's still not an aggressive horror film. Um, Although Andy, um, the director was definitely more um, cognizant of making sure that the scares were uh, more present that I guess, you know, the, the most common negative feedback that I heard with the first film was that it wasn't scary enough. So Andy definitely was um, setting out to make this one more arresting um, than the first film. And um, But it gets described as a horror film and obviously that feeds from Stephen King's you know, well-versed genre and people's expectations, of course, of reading the book, etc. But Andy's approach to the film, I definitely think, was to uh, play more character heart and relationships and the comedy element as well. You know, that um, is still prevalent in the uh, second one as much as it was the first. And yeah, it's definitely not. Um, it's definitely not setting out to be an aggressive horror. Um, in fact, you know, like the first film. The most fun is seeing an audience, you know, have a laugh and then turning around into a scare. And that's a tonal balance that these two films have been really successful in um, in doing. And then, of course, with the second film, I mean, it, it's such a deviation to the ending where it kind of gets a bit fantastical. Uh, whereas the first film was, you know, there's a boundary that isn't too realistic. <laughs> but if you um, if you believe the premise, then um, it sort of fits into a comfortable box. Whereas it too does uh, take a diversion for you know the cabin sequence, which uh, 
as I said, you know, a fantastical approach. But again, is um, honouring the book in some regards. I mean, the, the 90s um, two-part telly movie was similar also, and it's um, obviously a derivative of the source. Well, like the first one, the, the second film, building on your, your point about it's, it isn't really a horror film. The first one opens up with what I think is probably the most you know, horrific thing in the film in terms of, you know, visually and viscerally. And that's, you know, Georgie getting his arm bitten off. He, he encounters Pennywise. That's the, the engine that drives the whole story is, is the disappearance of Georgie. And you could have played it so that you just sort of see him get dragged away into the sewer or just there are any number of ways you could have done it. But you chose to show him getting his arm chomped. But then from there, you know, you, you'd sort of set the audience up with, okay, Without, the, without them knowing it, that's the high bar for the film. That's what's going to be the most gut-wrenching. And I think you kind of did that again in Chapter 2 with, the, you know, the homophobic assault and then Pennywise biting out Adrian's heart. I mean, that's horrific on a number of levels. One, because it's it's human. Um, you know, it's not something fantastical. That's something really horrific that actually happened in real life that the book is based on. Um, so you're, you're set up way in advance again at the, at the very beginning of the film for, like, this is viscerally gut-wrenching, horrific. And then from there, you're sort of, you're on edge about what could be happening. And there's certainly a lot of scares and a lot of scary things, but it's it's a little more fantastical, as you said, the rest of the way through the film. You know, there's nothing um, better, I think, than to slap an audience into, um, <laughs> into paying attention by having something that's pretty aggressive at the beginning. And of course, you know, again, the uh, homophobic bashing scene was um, straight from the book, so it wasn't Andy being insensitive to those social issues. But of course, it plays in today's times. So, um, you know, there was audience feedback regarding that scene because they're the first characters that you meet in the film, then uh, um, naturally an audience places more weight on them than what we um, at the end know um, their participation in the film is. So people are expecting the the bullies were um, later in the film going to have some payback of getting eaten by Pennywise or mm. something like that, which which never eventuates. And so Andy had um, discussed with the studio at certain points of um, shooting a scene that would be exactly that. He had a great idea where uh, Henry and Hoxetter, who had escaped from prison, <laughs> were um, driving down the road and stopped at traffic lights and they just happened to look across and the bullies were... Um, in a car, and uh, basically Henry and Hoxetter, you know, there was some exchange of, what are you looking at? <laughs> and uh, Henry and Hoxetter just got out of the car and, and um, bashed them up. Um, so, of course, it didn't have any correlation to their their understandings of what the bullies did at the beginning of the film, but from an audience's perspective, it would have, um, you know, felt like just as a, <laughs> seeing those uh, bullies getting bashed up. Well, that would have been pretty satisfying. Yeah, it would have been satisfying. Um, in fact, I think Andy's still talking about, you know, possibly doing that scene if there's a, um, an extended cut done. But yeah, it, uh, the, the studio didn't want to go for that because um, uh, the, uh, the Henry story um, line wasn't tracking as well um, with audiences' opinions. So there were um, a couple other scenes with um, Henry and Hoxetter that were um, deleted um, just to stay more uh, true to the loser story. Um, you know, there's a lot of characters. There's uh, seven children, seven adults, Pennywise, and then Henry and Hoxetter. Um, so there's, you know, a few uh, spinning plates to um, to keep uh, floating. Do I use that term? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a challenge enough without having to, um, and, and, you know, the finished film is, um, is a, um, a lengthy watch. Well, when we talked after the first film, you, you literally had said, so Andy wants to do chapter two with the adults, but then also with the kids, it's going to be a real challenge for you to, for me to manage all those story arcs, manage all those characters. Um, how big a challenge was it? Did that really come to fruition that it was a, as a bit of a struggle to just keep those plots all happening? Cause there, there's a lot of uh, activity that people are separate. I mean, there's a lot of what I would call vignettes where a character is off on their own, or there's a different, you know, the Henry plot that you talked about. How hard was that to manage? I mean, principally, of course, you know, a lot of that, um, nutting out was done during the writing of the script. There were, uh, Probably, I think from memory, about 12 scene deletions. There was minor scene rearrangements. Um, the Victoria scene under the, um, the bleachers with Pennywise is, as you say, a little bit of a floating island. So that was a scene that was so great, but kind of didn't really play for the bigger story, given that she was a sort of a standalone character. But, you know, we wanted to keep the scene, so it was a matter of finding a place for it. But in the scripted order, order it was pretty soon after the... Um, the opening carnival scene, but um, we moved it later just to 
give more of a throughput for introducing all of the adults. And the opening of the film, which was um, the last scene in chapter one, that was uh, scripted as I think around scene 12, but um, but I thought it'd be best to open the film with it just because um, that's where uh, the audience's last you know, recollection of the first film was. And the great thing about that particular scene, of course, is that um, uh, reiterates the whole point of the second film with um, if it comes back, you know, we promise that um, we'll come back to. Right. So it was a really nice way, I thought, to open the film and then um, off the shot of Mike um, traveling across, uh, revisiting Derry 27 years later where um, Mike, um, you know, drives us in his voiceover, um, which is fantastic because uh, he's the one character who recollects everything having never left Derry whereas um, all the other characters um, had forgotten um, being away from town. Yeah, and then all of the individual um, instances that, the, that they all have, um, you know, it takes up a lot of screen time, but it's important, and it kind of bogs down the second act a little bit, but, but um, it has to happen because everyone's out, off looking for their uh, token to participate in the ritual chud. Uh, and, of course, some of those um, uh, adult sequences are coupled with, um, with uh, 89 flashback memories as well. Um, so it kind of doubles the length of the individual characters' time um, finding their token. You know, it's funny you say that because as I was watching it, one of the things I thought was, well, okay, so there's in in the second act, there is they go to find their tokens um, for the ritual. They're like these little mini movies, these little vignettes. And, you know, if you really wanted to cheat, you could have really shortcutted those. And, you know, because they don't really drive plot forward. It's really more about character development and, and getting to know these people and what motivates them and why they have to do what they're doing. And you kind of realize that most of the movie is kind of like that. I mean, plot wise, it's not so super complex, but it's really about the human condition. And it's really about getting to know these people and what scares them and what scares people in general. Did it ever feel like you were pressured to try and cut those down because they weren't plot driving they were really more about character you know some of the things that were deleted were for example um uh, adult mike went to uh the burnt apartment um from when he was a child uh when his uh, parents were burnt in the fire so that was one incident of um a flashback scene that was coupled with um young mike in fact toddler mike and so that scene was um lifted because we uh, again you know getting bogged down in that middle section um, and we thought, well, Mike doesn't really have to go collect a token um, because he's lived in the town the whole time, and and it seems peculiar that you know this is one of that he would choose to go and visit his apartment that you know burnt uh, well over even 27 years ago. Uh, so yeah, we deleted that scene because it wasn't unnecessary. It was um it was a great um, conversational piece where Pennywise. You, you might have seen in the first trailer where Pennywise the first trailer for the second film, where Pennywise busts out of this wall and uh, he's literally sticking to the side of a wall with his shoes. There was a great conversation between, a short conversation between Pennywise and Mike, which was all about, um, you know, tasty, tasty fear kind of thing. Um, but again, you know, through needing to condense, that scene was dropped. And then what we did is, is to uh, reprise a little piece of the section was, um, you might remember when Mike was in the library just before um, adult Henry um, attacks him, when he's looking at the pages of the book that are um, telling him a lie that his uh, parents were junkies, we actually flashed back in portion to um, that broader scene of um, him as a little boy on his bicycle watching um, his parents' hands, you know, calling out to him through the door, the burning door. Um, but that was a, a lot longer sequence of you know, around two minutes. Well, speaking about cutting the film down, the first film, if I'm remembering right, um, had an assembly that was around, a first assembly that was around 3.40, and then a final runtime of 135 minutes? Um, yeah, this film's first assembly um, was, uh, I just looked it up in my little black book, um, <laughs> was uh, three hours and 54 minutes, and that's tight. <laughs> so there was, uh, the final film is uh, two hours 45, um, not including Enroller. But, you know, it's... Um, Big story to be told, and as we've just said, lots of characters. You know, it could have been shorter. I mean, the the ending could be fair to say that there's multiple endings to the film, but um, Andy um, was, you know, making a, a film for uh, the fans, those who really passionately love the characters. And it's kind of funny, even in our... We had six audience preview screenings, and even in our first screening, which was around maybe three hours 20, uh, we were still getting cards back where people going... Um, 
I just wanted it to last for longer. <laughs> um, so they were highlighted on the sheet and then uh, um, presented to the studio. Um, but nonetheless, of course, <laughs> still had the, uh, had the duty of um, trying to minimise. You know, even the finished film at two hours forty five is um, is less than one percent of uh, the shot material. Yeah, I noticed when that when I came to see you over the summer, um, when you were still cutting away, you know, the wall plastered with three by five cards and, and visual representations of scenes, which is is not uncommon in in editorial rooms for feature films. But you seem to really rely heavily on organic material to like keep you help you track the story, not so much you know in the avid, but there on your wall with the script because you, you literally have so many of these little story points and arcs to manage. Yeah, that's right, man. Um, yeah, I love, um, I guess, you know, because it's a visual aid, I just love having the, the scene cards. And on those scene cards, we had um, color coordinations. We had um, a color system for stickers, and we'd have um, a full red dot for any time that Pennywise was um, uh, as the clown present. Perfect. And then um, we had half, half red circles for any time that he was... Um, shape-shifting into some other character form like Mrs. Kirsch or whatever. And so um, then we had um, green dots for the 89 flashbacks. And, and so it was a really good, easy way to um, see that how consistently Pennywise is um, in the film just to keep his presence felt. Um, and same with the kids, you know, the 89 flashbacks. I mean, there was a limited opportunity to move those ones just because Andy and Checo, the DP, had um, crafted such beautiful scene transitions in camera that, uh, you know, we didn't want to destroy any of that, you know, beautiful craftsmanship that had been um, preconceived. So, you know, some some scenes were kind of locked together through their transitions and other scenes we uh, obviously moved around to um, benefit story. So with all the flashbacks, and there are many, there are times you do match cutting between past and present. So are those things where that's stuff that you've worked out with Andy and the DP ahead of time and you know that that's, that's the way the edit's going to be? Or did you find ways of manufacturing that in editorial? All of the really good ones um, <laughs> are, uh, are were preconceived. Yeah, most of them were um, camera moves, which is, you know, really fantastic. And, and then the ones that relied on edit were um, still pre-prescribed. It was just me having to do it, but, um, but it was pre-thought. Uh, like Beverly, um, young Beverly, talking about Stanley, saying, Stan, why are you always so sad? And then on the word sad, cutting back the interior of adult Beverly sitting inside the clubhouse. Um, like, that was all scripted, but, you know, Andy obviously composed it so that he had it would work really well. Yeah, but that's what I really enjoyed the most was those transitional things and, you know, adult Bill reaching into the um, to Stanley's tin and pulls out a shower cap and then match cutting to... Um, Young Stanley's similar action, pulling the shower cap out. I really love that kind of stuff. When I watch a film, I just think, you know, it kind of gives a reassurance that you're in good filmmaking hands to see that kind of stuff. So with all the jump scares that, that you need to do in a film like this, how much of that um, do you get in camera? Because I, I seem to recall with the first film, you were remarking, like, they're giving me such great stuff to work with, with these jump scares, with, you know, how they do the camera pans and how they reveal a character. And that's, that's really all, all it is. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Matt. Um, you know, again, anything preconceived and is uh, performed in a camera move, I think, uh, is usually a better result for um, for the audience because um, it doesn't feel manipulated, um, whereas any form of um, an edit, even subconsciously, feels a force of hand in some regard. You know, the, the blocking of the scene or however the action unfolds, um, some, some jump scares do require abrasive edits and um, sometimes there's edits that are meant to be seamless just to um, help incur, you know, not tipping the hat too early. You know, the good thing about the horror film and this one, there's such a variety, such a variation in um, how each thrill or scare, jump scare is to occur, and obviously you want to be mindful of sort of mixing it up so hopefully it doesn't become too telegraphed and predictable um, because the moment the audience are onto you, then, you know, it spoils it um but then the other rhythm too where you're completely flying in the face of um audience expectation and enjoying it is um when pennywise uh bit victoria under the bleachers you know that's completely playing with the rhythms of the cup where um on the count of three you know mm-hmm. i'll blow that birthmark off your cheek and it's definitely over labored i think to a perfect timing of um you meant to say three and then bang, she's attacked. <laughs> so all that, it's all just cutting rhythms and just fun doing it. 
it's kind of um, a bit disturbing how enjoyable it is to uh, kill people on screen. Yeah. Well, I mean, timing and horror and and timing and comedy as well is everything, obviously. And there's so many cool scenes I want to talk about. And so at the risk of just saying, now tell me about this, now tell me about this, I I do want to jump in and ask you about some specific scenes. You brought up the Victoria under the bleachers scene. Um, A scene that really stuck out for me in terms of your technique with timing. Eddie and his mother are in the basement with what I'll just call the bag creature or, you know, Pennywise and in the bag coming towards them. And so again, you're setting up Pennywise or it is struggling to get to them. His mother in in this fantasy vignette is begging Eddie to save her. He's terrified. And it's really just um, your sleight of hand in terms of how quickly that bag gets to that point that makes the scene so exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's fun. You know, it's, um, that was actually additional photography, that scene. It's, um, we did have another scene, which basically was uh, Eddie came down, young Eddie came down the stairs to which there was a long line of very sick men all coughing and spluttering and even a couple of them farting um, as he uh, walked along um, the uh, the vaccine line. And when he got to the uh, yellow curtains at the end, he um, ripped them back and laying on a um, delivery table was um, his mum. A similar situation, basically, again, you know, just to um, play up on Eddie being a coward where she was being tied down by the hobo <laughs> and calling out, you know, Eddie, Eddie, save me, save me. Um, and Mr. Keene was doing a little uh, uh, pantomime dance routine in the background. It was pretty wacky and out there. But, uh, yeah, the studio uh, kind of felt that it wasn't scary enough and it, it, didn't have, um, it didn't have that pendulum of fear type element to it. It was just completely absurd and had um, the hobo... Um, tongue kissing Mrs. K. Um, so the studio said, you know, that's more in the realm of um, funny than horrific. Um, and so uh, that's why the interior of the, um, the curtain was reshot um, to be uh, the scene that you know now with the hobo um, chained up, making his way um, towards Mrs. K. And then uh, when um, young Eddie sprints out of the yellow curtain area um, and uh, in camera transitions to adult Eddie. Then from that point on was um, the original photography where uh, the hobo attacked adult Eddie. There's another scene that I want to talk about um, that I, as I was watching it, I thought, well, this must have been a lot of fun to cut, but probably pretty challenging. And that's the funhouse scene where Bill is in the hall of mirrors trying to save the kid from Pennywise because it's very disorienting. You don't know where anything is. You're literally looking at a hundred images of, of a character being reflected all over the place. How tricky was that to craft? Um, my approach to um, that scene was getting uh, Peter Elliott, the um, uh, the editor who came on to help me for five weeks and <laughs> get him to make the first pass on it. <laughs> um, it was at, at the end of shoot and uh, I had so much going on and I was behind and producers were wanting to see the first assembly. Uh, so, um, yeah, New Line were great with bringing on uh, Peter and he was tremendous and it was only meant to be for a couple of weeks, but it ended up growing into five weeks, I think, um, where Peter tackled about 10 scenes um, assembling. And um, of course, you know, Andy worked them from there, but um, Peter's contribution was fantastic and um, such a breath of fresh air to suddenly just have this thing assembled to start, you know, truly working upon. Um, so, Peter was uh, first first to assemble um, the mirror sequence, and I mean, principally, at Peter's edit from uh, the moment adult Bill uh, runs into the clown's mouth, where um, uh, you know the red and white sort of lines are in that circular tunnel, um, through the um, punching bags, and then through to the mirror, and then uh, Andy um, quite heavily reworked Pennywise bashing his head, um, while Dean's kind of stuck in the little boy Dean is um, stuck in that little area. The tale of it, uh, Andy and I did a bit on, but um, all credit to Pete. So when you were talking about the Eddie scene, you'd made a point about, hey, this is playing too funny. And part of what, um, you know, what makes something more scary is because you have these moments of levity where you, you put the audience at ease just so you can come back again and hit them over the head with something terrifying. Was that a conversation that took place a lot, whether between you and Andy or, or you guys in the, in the studio, about the balance of comedy and horror? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the a lot of the comedy again was written into the script. Um, there were there were a few um, ad lib variations on the day, but but principally, um, you know, we wouldn't steer too far off course. Although um, the brilliance of Bill Hader, for example, brought so much to the adult Richie character, where um, you know, I think he um, fares as 
probably one of the best characters in terms of um, a conclusive arc, but also um, popularity. You know, his humour, the delivery of his humour is really tremendous. So, you know, he was kind of our comedy character that we could lean on through the film, and Eddie too. Um, and their relationship was really fantastic, um, just in terms of they're kind of like a married couple, <laughs> um, annoyed with each other, but presumably deep down, obviously, whether they're in love or, or there's, you know, obviously a, a regard and fondness, uh, whether it's two-way or just Richie the Eddie, that's unknown. But I don't, you know, specifically remember kind of deleting comedy. I don't think, you know, we did a delete comedy pass um, because <laughs> we felt that it was interfering with the, the scares. Um, yeah, again, it's just falling back to tonal balance and we had to make the scares as good as we could and have the audience enjoy the comedy. Well, you talked about um, early on about some of the visual effects elements. Um, the first film, uh, I think the budget was around $35 million. This one's about twice that. And I can imagine, obviously, the cast has a lot to do with that, you know, adult actors um, and named actors. But was the visual effects budget on this one bigger? Because it certainly it felt like there were more visual effects elements in this film throughout as opposed to the first film. You know, I don't know the, the dollar figures for the visual effects department, but um, uh, we definitely had a bigger allocation. Like every film, there's always compromise. And Andy had uh, some huge creative ideas that financially were, uh, you know, he wasn't able to perform. But that's Andy. You know, he's such such a creative and always thinking of new stuff and even just adding elements that um, are to existing and new conceptual ideas. You know, that's just the brilliance of his mind. And visual effects gave us great support where uh, uh, Nick Brooks, who was the uh, supervisor, was you know always willing and open to um, take on new ideas. And, you know, it was getting to the pointy end of the stick at times too with um, running out of runway, as Nick would say, <laughs> um, to deliver shots. But Andy would keep pressing and, and um, in a good way um, to, you know, all for the betterment of the film. Um, yeah, it was really, you know, it was great. I mean, obviously there's a process for cutting empty plates and stuff and, um, it's a development with visual effects and as things come through, you keep refining and generally the action sequences are way too long and then through um, feeling the rhythm of the cut as well as uh, visual effects saying <laughs> this thing's way over budget, um, you revisit and you keep um, honing and trimming down. And there was one sequence actually that we dropped um, where Bill gets um, caught by Spider Pennywise and is actually brought up into um, Pennywise's... Um, uh, under his legs is kind of like um, this gross mouth, and so Bill was starting to get sucked up into the mouth, and then um, and then Bill bites one of the tentacles, and Pennywise releases him, and he falls to the ground and sprints off and dives into the water. Um, so you know that sequence was again kind of like a, a a deviation; it wasn't necessarily story critical, and so you know that coupled with the visual effects overage that. Um, was dropped. So opposite to visual effects, sound, and that's something that plays a, a really large role in in a horror movie or in a, in a movie where you're trying to scare an audience. Do you find that you have to lean more in editorial on sound tricks and techniques to get an edit to work? And do you pay more attention to sound on a film like this? Yeah, Bill Dean and uh, um, Nancy Nugent Title were our um, two um, sound supervisors. Um, and they were on early in the piece. Um, and were uh, really supportive as the Carters were going through, and they had their uh, design team, which were really tremendous in coming up with um, unique sounds. Um, and so, you know, they were they were um, started by giving us um, spot effects, and then, of course, as we uh, developed and they had time to work on sequences, they'd start giving us stems back with um, detailed sound and even cleaning up dialogues and stuff like that. And so their contribution was great, and Andy was really engaged. Um, this time around with, with sound, um, uh, which yeah, made it a really you know, fantastic collaborative um, uh, environment. Um, Lisa Richardson was um, the music editor. She was um, just down the hall uh, and uh, um, in the early days um, acting before, uh, before Ben Wolfish, the composer, came on to start scoring original pieces. So it was a, you know, a really fantastic supported team. It uh, worked really well and being all close to each other meant that it was easy for Andy to whip around to the varying departments. Visual effects were just upstairs and we were cutting up Warners and we had a really great um, a great room layout where everyone was really close just to 
cold palm, the flow of uh, working. And, you know, we're dealing with such a long edit for such a long time that, um, uh, you know, the, the crews kind of bloomed a little bit there for, um, for a little while, while um, each department sort of needed help to help um, get their workload completed. So I'm going to follow up in a second on another sound point, but you brought up just a really long edit for a really long time. Um, and the one of the other takeaways I had from watching the film, not as just a viewer, but as somebody appreciating the work that you had to do, was having your your head in a, a space like that for so long. And, you know, editing is, is a long process or can be a long process and can be emotionally and mentally fatiguing. On a film like this, it's dark and, and dealing with... Um, overtones that are kind of like, uh, you know, weighing on you. How, how hard is it? I was super excited to be doing it. And, and um, so, you know, there wasn't a day that I was um, uh, not wanting to be there or um, taxed by the material. Um, I mean, the, the volume of the material was certainly taxing and uh, particularly that first assembly. Like I find it just so incredibly arduous to get that formulated, but, but, you know, there is so much reward with um, putting a huge effort into the assembly. Um, not only, of course, through the assembly, you get to learn the dailies. And, yeah, I mean, the, the only taxing thing really was, um, you know, managing what was 10 reels of film ended up as eight reels. You know, it's just it's just a lot of movie. I mean, we were literally dealing with, we were making two films um, in terms of the duration. So there's just a lot to manage a lot to think about and um, not only through story correlations but even just the minutiae of um, you know having to remember the details of we've got to have that effect or Andy's preference for music's this or the only the only time that I didn't feel well actually <laughs> there was cutting the cavern sequence and um, I was thinking because that took um, a couple of weeks or whatever um, for first assembly and I was getting all these headaches and I couldn't work out what was going on. And then, and then I was talking to a crew member who said when the cabin sequence finished shooting, they said, God, I'm so happy to be out of there. I was getting headaches. And I was like, oh, my God, it, it's the flashing lights. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> so, you know, watching 12 hours of strobe light, I, mean, I think it's reasonable to think you'll get a headache. Yeah, that that sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah. So you said it's like making two films. And obviously you literally did make two films. For the second one... We talked all about the flashbacks and the kids. Did you borrow any footage from the original film whatsoever, or was it all new material where the kids had to be de-aged digitally? Yeah, that's right, Matt. Um, the only two scenes, or well, that I can recall right now, that uh, were reprises from the first film were um, the very opening of Chapter 2, the, um, the Blood Oath, and then um, the street fight where young Bill punches young Richie in the face on the street and they um, all the losers divide just prior to um, you know going on their individual journeys in the first film. Um, so those are the only two scenes that uh, we pulled from the first film. We had all of the media from the first film available. In fact, I did a pass through the first film and pulled out lots of little sound bites and things like that and filtered them through the second film, just trying to find ways of um, you know trying to bring the two films together. Um, that was kind of fun. But yeah, all the... Um, all the other 89 flashbacks in the second film were purposely shot um, where the kids were two years later. And um, boy, talk about the wrong time to uh, cast adolescents because I <laughs> think for the boys, it was literally their growth spurt. And so, yeah, um, there was a, um, a bit of de-aging. Not, not all the characters did, but yeah, there were three that I can think of that had a lot of uh, de-aging performed. Um, and even so much as voice pitching and things like that, trying to um, trying to uh, um, get them more um, aligned to what people would have remembered from the first one. So I said I wanted to get back to talking about sound. What I really want to get back to is talking about the absence of sound. And a uh, note that you had made in a previous conversation we had about the power of silence to set up a scare. Did you ever find a situation where you were removing sound because it, it wasn't scary enough? There were um, a couple instances where we tried... Um, pulling the sting and just letting the moment play. Like when um, uh, young Ben is in his high school locker and the camera pans left to reveal Pennywise just there. Um, and what we did is we uh, delayed the sting to a second beat. So the first beat hopefully being an audience reaction and then supported by you know, a second sting. And so there were a few trials in that regard. And um, on the mixing stage, you know, it's always a constant uh, um, deliberation between 
um, sound's contribution and music's contribution and, and trying to find a balance between those two elements and, you know, pulling score at times and pulling effects at times. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's a point of discovery and, um, you know, some of it was mapped during the offline and most of it was um, crafted on the, on the final mix stage with, um, with the mixes. So one of the things that stands out in this film is um, the use of cameos. And there's, um, there's a big yeah. cameo. Um, and, of course, I speak of director Peter Bogdanovich. <laughs> what, what was yeah. he doing in there? Well, I think Andy just really admi- you know, admires um, you know, his body of work and thought it would be fun to have him in. And it was kind of fun. And I think, um, yeah, I think, I think he did a great job. And, of course, Stephen, uh, Stephen King is uh, the... Um, Secondhand Rose shopkeeper was hilarious too, and you know, I just love all the little funny lines of um, uh, uh, "So you're a big author, are you?" You know those kind of things. Uh, you know, I think just really playful, and of course, um, the running gag through the film of um, Bill's book being um, a crappy ending. That's right. Um, uh, and for Stephen to deliver that, and yeah, we played with performances in there where Stephen said other lines that we repeated. Um, uh, you can afford it, you know, again, just sort of, I guess, a tip towards, uh, I, don't, I don't suppose nowadays Stephen King's uh, bank balance is too shy of um, having to eat Vegemite sandwiches every day. No, I think even um, back in the 80s, he was hearing people tell him he could afford it, but what do I know? Yeah. Yeah, that that, so. that scene was um, was de- definitely in terms of levity, I, I just, that was a nice break, a nice beat where the audience could just sort of start laughing and relax. Um, before things really started amping up again, and that was th- that that looked like something that would be a lot of fun to cut. Yeah, it was. I mean, I loved um, I love those little cutaways of um, uh, the beaver and bowling ball. I mean, there were, Andy had a lot of them. There were baseball cards, Barbies, badminton rackets. Uh, he he shot a whole heap of different things. So you know, the first assembly had quite a few in there, and then we just kept playing with that comedic rhythm rhythm to um, eventually just have two picture cutaways, even though he mentioned three things. I love the cut after that scene where, um, you know, there's a big ramp up of adult Bill as he walks his bicycle out of the shop saying, um, this bike's fast enough to beat the devil. Right. And then, you know, heart cut to him on the street where the comedic moment of um, his handlebars falling down. And, you know, again, just fun and building anticipation and then letting, you know, letting it all drop in a comedic moment. So all those kind of rhythms are fun to experiment with. You know, I feel somewhat close to um, the Stephen King world of the last four years. However, um, I think you trump most people when it comes <laughs> to uh, um, having inside story. Can you um, can you uh, tell us um, your Stephen King story? Okay, okay. I think I owe you that much since I kept you up late at night on the Sunday. So when we first started talking about it, or when you you told me you were going to be cutting it, I laughed and I said, "Oh, you know, my father was killed by Pennywise." You had a laugh, and I said, "No, no, in the book." I actually, I haven't read the book. What was his name in the book? His name was John Fury in the book. So Stephen, you know, long story short, I grew up in, in the real dairy, um, with an association with Stephen and his family. And, and, um, he has a habit or at least then had a habit of putting people that he knew in his books as sort of, um, B characters. So on a, on a few occasions, my father has, has been some of these books. So he was killed off in, in it, um, and I think he was in the Tommy Knockers too, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, do you think, um, can you, can your father ever recollect not returning Stephen's lawnmower or something like that? <laughs> you know, like, was there some kind of neighborhood battle yeah. going on that he's now being killed in his book? Oh no, I, I think Stephen had plenty of good reasons to kill off my father, but, um, but none that I would go into <laughs> right now, but, uh, yeah, it is, it is, it's kind of fun to see it come back. Um, you know, it's really fun to see Stephen get, um, sort of a second life in his career. Um, and I think it had a lot to do with it. I think that was sort of one of the bigger things that brought attention back to his work. There's other things, young stranger things, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's my tie into the Stephen King universe. (laughs) That's fantastic to think that, um, you would have been uh, in his household during, um, during all those amazing writing years. Yeah, no, I watched him bang away on what was then a, a, a word processor, the Wang word processor, which is now defunct. And, uh, you know, he had a habit of cranking up rock music to like unprecedented decibel levels while he was writing. I never could understand how he could do that. But, you know, I watched him <laughs> probably, uh, he must have been working on it at the time, um, rewriting the stand, um, all kinds of stuff. It was, uh, yeah, it was the 80s that I really spent a lot of time around uh, he and his family. And there was definitely a lot to, a lot of stories. 
Is there um, any truth in um, the rumor that uh, Danny from The Shining is uh, based on you? <laughs> no, none whatsoever. Although, you know, I did ask him once, um, we were riding along in the car and I had asked him about Danny not dying at the end of The Shining. I said, how come Danny doesn't die? How did, you know, why did he get away? And, uh, you know, he could have answered it a million different ways. And he said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't kill off women and children, which clearly was a lie that he was... <laughs> Telling to me to spare my young ears because, um, yeah, he's he's proved himself a hypocrite more than once. Um, certainly with it, so yeah, uh, so cool. You mentioned a few times I really enjoyed cutting this or that. Is there a favorite scene you've had in this film? Is there a, a, a scene you found most satisfying, or looking back when you watch it, you you get the most enjoyment out of? I don't know. The, the first one that comes to mind is basically the clubhouse. I really like those four scenes that um. And it begins with adult Bill falling through um, the trap door and, uh, sorry, adult Ben. And then, um, you know, the camera, uh, his POV tilting up to then introduce young Beverly walking down the ladder. Um, you know, and I think, I think what I like about that is um, just the, the seamless scene transitions, um, plus the comedy of those guys. Um, you know, the, the young kids <laughs> babbling away and messing around, I, I do find that funny and, you know, the, the, and then to turn to the adults where, you know, there's that fake gag of um, adult Richie pretending he's Pennywise hidden in the darkness <laughs> and uh, Bill Hader's uh, ad-libbing for the Pennywise dance. You know, do, uh, just that kind of stuff is great. But then, you know, on a dime to turn into um, uh, the reflective sadness for, um, for um, them thinking about what um, adult Stan would have been like um, nowadays. And, you know, so those kind of, those kind of, uh, tonal changes of, you know, I think they were really successfully navigated in the film and yeah, the, the, that's what's rewarding. I guess, I guess that's why that sequence comes to mind. First of all, have you had a chance to see the film in the theater yet? Not with true public. However, um, at the premiere, um, it, uh, screened in two theaters at, um, uh, Westwood in Los Angeles and, one of the theaters um, held uh, holds fourteen hundred people, so that was um, that was well above um, our audience preview numbers, <laughs> um, audience participants, and it was tremendous to um, to uh, hear the audience there. And in fact, you know, there are even times where the audience are laughing so much that they're laughing so much at the setup that they're then actually mishearing the joke as well. But you know, that's that's the fun of watching with a big audience and. Actually, it was Andy's um, birthday on the premiere day, and it was so much fun to um, uh, hear the audience all sing him "Happy Birthday." <laughs> um, so he was he was out the front with the cast members, and yeah, it was it was really nice for him to to have that. Yeah, this movie making stuff's not too bad, is it? Sometimes, most <laughs> of the time. All right, Jason, I've kept you up long enough. I know you had a long day today. I'm sure every day is a long day, uh, and I also know you 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 did this as a favor to me and I, that didn't go unnoticed and I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for your time, Matt. Thanks for, thanks for everything you do for uh, the editing community at large. They're my favorite people. Who knew a guy who could make such scary movies could be so nice, but he is one of the all time greats and a tremendous editor as well. A big thank you to our friend from down under Mr. Jason Ballantyne for finding the time to call in while he's hard at work, making another great movie. And editors work really hard, in case that wasn't obvious, and usually spend a lot of time away from friends and family. So it's a tough business, and you have to love it to do it well. And that's what all these people on the show are, creative people who just do what they do really, really well. I know that Avid would love to help you do what you want to do really well, and that's by making it easy for you to get your hands on the same tools that Mr. Ballantyne uses to edit. That would be Media Composer. Never been a better time to give it a try. Just go to my.avid.com and create an account, download a free trial, and check out the new Media Composer. If you haven't seen Media Composer lately, you really haven't seen it. How's that for a pitch? And how is this for a podcast? I hope you liked it. I sure had fun doing it. And that's why I'll do it again. Until then, this is Mad Fury thanking you for joining me on this edition of The Rough Guy. <laughs>